In this video, I'll be introducing how subgroups can help us analyze the groups as a whole. One of the most important theorems about subgroups is what is known as Lagrange's theorem. What it states is that if H is a subgroup of G, meaning that H is a subset of G, and H is a group under the same operation as G, the order of H, which is the number of elements in H, has to divide the order of G, meaning that the order of G divided by the order of H is going to be an integer. So this is a nice restriction on what the subgroups of G can be. Now the proof of this is, uh, involves cosets. So first fact we're going to use is that all of the cosets of H are distinct. So what this means is that suppose I had X an element of two cosets, g h, and x is also going to be an element of g prime h. What does this mean? Well, this means that x is going to be equal to some g h, and this one means that x is going to be some g prime h prime. This is for h in h, and then g here is what the, the coset is. Well then, by the transitivity of equality, I have gh equals g prime h prime, which means that g is equal to g prime h prime h inverse. Oh, well, you know what that means? That means that g is just an element of g prime h, by definition. So that means that if x is an element of gh and x is an element of g prime h, well, that means that gh equals g prime h, because an element of a coset generates the same coset. There are no two different cosets that share elements, so they're distinct. Number two is going to be that, well, they are all the same size. Now, the reason for this is because, well, it's pretty easy. There is a bijection between h and gh, which just sends little h to g little h. So this is very clearly a bijection as you can check and therefore they're the same size. Well then the proof goes as follows. g, the entire group, has to be equal to the union for g and g of the cosets. That's very easy to see. But remember each of these cosets are distinct. So from each of these cosets, I'm going to pick a representative. Say from the first coset, I pick a representative G1H. And then from the second coset, I'm going to pick another representative G2H. Union all the way up until GNH. So these are all distinct cosets by the first one. And I'm just picking a single representative from each of these distinct cosets. What does that imply? Well, the order of G is then going to be equal to, because this is a disjoint union, this is going to be equal to the order of G1H plus all the way up until the order of GNH. Because that's how uh, sets work. If you union a bunch of disjoint sets and you want to find how many elements are in it, you just add up the number of elements in each of the sets. Oh, well, each of these have the same size as h by number 2. Well, then I'm just adding up the order of h n times, which is just n times the order of h. So therefore, the order of g is some multiple of the order of h. Therefore, the order of h divides the order of g. A quick corollary is that the order of some elements of the group has to divide the order of the group. The reason for this is because the order of the cyclic group generated by that element, which is just the order of that element, has to divide the order of G by this fact. So how exactly does this help us analyze the structure of groups? Well, let's look at, say, the, a group which has order of a prime. And now take some element of G. All right. Well, I know then that the order of the cyclic group generated by G, I'm writing it this way, and you'll see why, has to divide the order of G by this theorem. Which means that because the order of G is prime, 
that the order of the cyclic group generated by G has to either be 1 or P. 1 is only, it's only going to be equal to 1 if G is the identity. So it has to be equal to P. But the entire group is of order P, and it's closed under the operation, which means that G has to be equal to the cyclic group generated by G. And this is for G not equal to the identity. So we know absolutely nothing about the group other than that it has order P for a prime, and then we instantly get that it's cyclic. So this theorem is very helpful in analyzing groups, although it may not seem like it initially. Now another fact about cyclic groups is that if I have G a cyclic group, and I have H a subgroup of G, that means that H is cyclic. Let K be the minimum of N such that N is bigger than zero and G to the N is an element of H. All right, so this must have a minimum because it's bounded below. So in other words, K here is the minimum power of G that's in H. I claim H is the cyclic group generated by a G to the K. Why is this? Well, suppose H is an element of H. Then H is going to be equal to some power of G, say G to the M. This is because G is cyclic. Well, M can be represented as some N times K plus L for L between 0 and K. This is modular arithmetic. Or in other words, M is congruent to L mod K. Now let's multiply this by g to the minus nk. This is going to be an element of h. So then this is going to be equal to g to the nk plus l times g to the minus nk, which is just g to the l. Now remember, g to the k is the smallest power of g that's in h. And l is between 0 and k, so therefore this is just the identity, meaning that that l is 0. So therefore, h is generated by g to the k, because every h in h is a power of g to the k. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if I have h, a subgroup of z, which is the cyclic group generated by 1 under addition, then I know that h has to be equal to a cyclic group generated by some k, which is just k times z. So every subgroup is some k times z. Now you may argue that z is not equal to the cyclic group generated by 1. It's the cyclic group generated by 1 and minus 1. But actually this does not take away from the proof. Suppose h is a subgroup of z mod nz. Well that means that h has to be isomorphic to z mod mz. Correct? because it's cyclic and finite. But then by Lagrange's theorem, m here has to divide n. So now the subgroups of z mod nz are just cyclic groups of order that divide n. Let's diverge and study quotient groups for a moment. Now let's suppose h is going to be a normal subgroup of g. This is how I write it. I don't know if I introduced it yet. Now there's an interesting property in that there is a bijection between the subgroups of G that contain H and just the subgroups of G mod H. Namely, what we do is we send K to K mod H. And this is a bijective map. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between subgroups that contain H and subgroups of G mod H. So for example, let's take Z as our group, K as our subgroup, and PZ for some prime P to be our um, normal subgroup. Then I can correspond this to some H, a subgroup of Z, the entire group, mod PZ. But the only subgroup of Z mod PZ are going to be the trivial ones. So H is either going to be the trivial subgroup or the entire um, group itself, Z mod PZ. Well, this means that either K is going to be equal to PZ 
or it's going to be equal to z. Basically meaning there are no subgroups other than pz that contain pz. pz is a maximal subgroup. Now, you may argue that none of this seems to be very important. Well, actually, if you look at the center of a group in particular, you'll see the uses of analyzing subgroups. If I have a group G, I can construct a normal subgroup Z. Now, Z is going to be defined to be the set of Z in G such that ZG equals GZ for every G and G. So it commutes with every element of the group. That's an interesting concept. And an interesting fact about this is that if G mod Z is cyclic, say it's generated by some GZ, if it's a cyclic group, this means that G is abelian. That's a weird fact, but let's show it. Suppose I have X an element of G. That means that XZ, a coset of Z, has to be equal to G to the A Z. This is by this fact. And due to the fact that cosets are distinct, I know that X has to be equal to G to the A times some Z, and this is for Z an element of Z, a specific one. So what does this mean? Well, let's take X times Y. X times Y is G to the A times Z times G to the B times Z prime. And this is for Z, Z prime, and Z. Well then, what I can do is use the fact they are in the center of G, meaning that they commute with every single element. So now what I can do is switch Z and G to the B. So I get G to the B, Z instead. Multiply it by Z prime. Oh, but now G to the A and G to the B can commute. That's an easy fact. So let's just commute them. And Z and Z prime can commute, so let's do that. So now I have G to the B, G to the A, Z prime, Z. Now let's use the fact that this is in the center again to switch those two. So now I get G to the B times Z prime times G to the A, Z. Oh, would you look at that? G to the B, Z prime, Y, G to the A, Z, X. It's a billion. X times Y equals Y times X. Every single element commutes, as long as G mod Z is cyclic. How can I use this fact? Well, let's suppose the order of G is P squared. Then Z is a subgroup of G, so that means that I have a couple possibilities. The order of z is p squared, and z here is the center, which means that g mod z is the uh, trivial group. Oh, well the trivial group is cyclic. So then we have g is abelian. Alright, then let's suppose the order of z is p. Then g mod z has the property that its order is also p. Due to the fact that g mod z is the number of cosets, i.e. n in this example, so n here is the order of g divided by the order of h, so the order of g, p squared, the order of z, p, p squared over p is just p. But g mod z is a prime, which by this fact means it's cyclic. So therefore g is abelian again. Well, what if the order of z is equal to 1? Well, this actually never happens. You can prove that z is never trivial as long as the order of g is p squared. You can prove that this can never happen. I'm not going to do it here. This video is already very long. So now you see a direct result where we know nothing about the group, and we use subgroups, a special subgroup, to prove that it has special properties. So now you can see the importance of subgroups in group theory. And that's it. Oh my god guys, here are the snitches out. I can't wait to just put more death grips at the end of these videos. Uh, and it, it, it you're the snitch, it's really good. Uh, um, that's um, um,